Does it do it or not? <laughs> Depends on if she's here or not. <laughs> you might say, well, it's 7.3 out of 50. You know, what's, the, what's the context of the quantitative metric? You would say, uh, making some assumptions, you might say it's monogamous. That's a qualitative metric. You might say it's fun. That's a qualitative metric. And what you'll find in most of your work, I'm assuming, is the absence of qualitative metrics. Mm -hmm. And in my approach, the qualitative metrics can be as rigorous as the quantitative. But you have to learn to incorporate adjectives in a very precise way. Okay. The core principles of the 3Ms approach. By the way, not for tonight or in the handout, but there's another eight or nine slides you will get by email that have more principles. But I didn't want to overwhelm you with principles because most of this approach has to be experiential. It has to hook you emotionally for your own project. So it's just not something out there. It is what you can compare. So that makes, that I think is uh, unique. Everything is measurable. Often in the management world, people say if you can't quantify it, you can't measure it. Absolutely not true. You know, when you wake up in the morning and I'm making an assumption, you have a whole bunch of metrics in your head. I'm going to be at the office. That's a qualitative metric. By a certain time, that's a quantitative metric. Dressed in a certain way, those are qualitative metrics. And I'm going to get there this way, and those are qualitative metrics. So your whole life, every hour, every minute, is, is one of managing metrics, most of which are qualitative. Measure equals qualitative and quantitative. And I've said this, qualitative metrics can be as rigorous as the quantitative. Now, how many of you have watched competitive ballroom dancing? Or, okay. And, or you do it. Used to. Used to. Yeah, likewise. And in ballroom dancing, you've seen maybe 10 judges, and the way they score a couple, that 10 judges from 10 countries. What's the, vari the variance between scores? Like 0.5? You know, so they all have this template in their head of what is a 10. And likewise in gymnastics, ice skating, ballet. So there are all kinds of qualitative metrics that judges use, and they're very, very precise. I was taking dance lessons in Chicago, and my teacher said, do you want to dance competitively? And I said, fine. And she said, but I'm not good enough. Are you willing to pay for us to have a teacher? So this guy came in, and, and you know, if I, when you go out to the dance floor, you hold your hand in a certain way, you look at the judge and smile, and you don't hold your hand like that, it's like that. I mean, every position of my hand and fingers, it's very, very precise. So that's just one example of qualitative metrics. And you know this yourself in terms of looking at someone and how they're dressed and making judgments. But that, I don't want to get into that too deeply. It would just take, okay. Project management service line. That was the job I had at Oracle. It was Oracle. And describe the elements of measurement in qualitative and quantitative terms and identify the key metrics and support systems. Now, I'm not going to go down this list. It's all in the book. And each line is amplified as far as the definition. But this was my amazing task to look at this huge multi-billion dollar company and all of its project management practices and identify metrics for each of those <coughs> categories. Continuity for duration. At Oracle, and I can't address the whole project management world, it's very often people have multiple project assignments, mm -hmm. and someone who started the project with you may disappear <coughs> one day, and they're on another project. It's typically under a program management office, if your organization has that. At that level, that person is supposed to allocate resources, including people, across projects. But very often, you have a project management environment with no program management. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's about. Can we have continuity and then how do you measure it? And how do you make sure that people who started on the project, if they don't finish the project, 
at least there's some continuity and transition, you know, of new people coming on board as other people sort of uh, disappear overnight. Okay. Measure. I've, some of this gets redundant, but um, I've had people go this through a comparable presentation two and three times and come up to me and say, why didn't you say that the first time? <laughs> well, I did. It just takes a while to get it. And one of my bosses at Oracle kept saying, no, we have to quantify it. And I was trying to train him to say we have to measure it because we don't know a priori if the metric is qualitative or quantitative. But after I started threatening to slap him, he started saying, we have to measure that. <laughs> that's, that's probably the, that's the technique. <laughs> <laughs> that's the Management by abuse. <laughs> MBA. Okay. Uh, that's probably one of the most difficult habits I've had in, in this line of work of getting people to stop saying we have to quantify it and saying we have to measure it and then determining regarding the results is it qualitative only, quantitative only, or some appropriate mix of both? Determine in qualitative and quantitative terms, units, key performance, indicators. How many have used the terms KPI? Yeah, internationally, KPI is like the World Bank and UN model, and it's often difficult just to get vocabularies to be in agreement. What a successful task or project will achieve. And that's the old MBO. And uh, George Odiorn, the godfather of MBO, said, before engaging in any activity or investing any time, effort, or money, first determine in measurable terms what you want to accomplish. That's step one. Before you do anything else, get agreement within the team what will be a successful outcome. And I know at Oracle, and I worked at Quaker Oats, and they're a chemicals division, nothing to do with the cereal. Um, I'd approach a new project manager and say, hey, let's, let's go through this. And they'd say, I don't have time now. We're under a lot of pressure to get this project going. We'll figure out what we're supposed to do later. <laughs> and by that time, they've wasted <laughs> hours and days of conflict and confusion. So it's very difficult, given organizational dynamics, to get people to stop action and say, what's the successful outcome? And spend whatever amount of time it takes. Because if you don't do that, you're going to be in for a lot of trouble later. That's logical. It's not emotional. OK. Quantitative, and you know these metrics, money, number of completed projects or accidents, if it's an accident reduction project, higher settled legal cases if it's legal, and qualitative, customer satisfaction, corporate culture, background of new hires, etc. So that's the measure part. Manage. Once you've identified in precise measurable terms what a successful outcome is, you step back and it's kind of like a SWOT in strategic planning. You know, survey the environment. What are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? What procedures and systems do we have in place that will help or hinder achieving the very precise and clear result we all agree we're here to achieve? It's all very logical but it's not the way it works in, with emotional uh, dynamics and pressures that people have. And then to manage toward that successful result that you've all defined very precisely, you identify and change the systems that will help or hinder accomplishment, and these can be personnel, technical, blah, 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 and methodologies and programs, diversity, OD, training, etc. And magnify. Assuming you've measured, and it's all very precise, and there's internal clarity, and you've managed, you're going along well, and you've achieved the standard of at least satisfactory, and I'll define it later more so, but satisfactory earns your paycheck, or your consulting fee, whatever your status happens to be. To magnify, you upgrade your standards of performance from year to year, or you raise your bar. So what was satisfactory in 2016 in 2017, because you're likely doing a lot of the same thing over again, and you've learned a lot about how to help the process go ahead faster, cheaper, or better, you might achieve a higher standard. So satisfactory in year two or three is no longer satisfactory. 
the very good standard you established becomes satisfactory and excellent, which is phenomenal, is very good, and then you create a new higher standard of excellent. And here are the standards I've just run over. And I always start with satisfactory. What achievement earns your paycheck or your consulting fee? And let's start there. And then we and then I ask, and what will be better than that? There'll be additional metrics, typically of the nature better, faster, cheaper. And what will be extraordinary and nearly impossible? It cannot be impossible or it's not valid. And some of you maybe for political reasons or internal dynamics, you have agreed to impossible objectives. And everyone knows they are impossible and in my approach, invalid. You know, it's political and game playing. It's not the authentic metrics approach. And then ultimately, you take all of your objectives, and I'll show you some what I call performance scorecards. I'm, I've worked in uh, Mombasa, Kenya this last year, and they'd already adapted balance scorecard. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's okay. <laughs> But most of my job was to fix it. And because the consulting firm, um, Deloitte, the local franchisee, did not train it right and did not, the contract did not require additional support. And when you introduce anything of a macro change level, like balance scorecard for the Port of Mombasa with 8,000 employees, it's not a two day workshop that gets everything going. And they just didn't incorporate, you know, the weekly, monthly reinforcement of balance scorecard. Balance scorecard is good, but a lot of it's really unnecessary. It's it's very sophisticated, and never mind about that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, the, the performance scorecard is you take the weighting of the objective, because I use weightings, not priorities, times the standard being achieved. Is it being achieved at satisfactory, very good, or excellent, and that's the value. And value is delivering results for the money you're, you're paying or get paid for. You know, when you buy a new car and the salesman says 50,000 miles of no maintenance, and that's what you get, you say, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, that's satisfactory. If you should drive the car 60,000 miles and no maintenance, you've gotten 20% greater value, right? 10 is 20% of 50, thank you. And that's what I call very good. And if you drive the car for 80 or 90,000 miles without maintenance, that's excellent. It's, it's beyond anyone's expectations and it was achieved. So all of these different standards can be very precisely distinguished one from the other. And one reason a lot of people, and I'll say more so in government worldwide, because I've worked with many governments, is the distinction between satisfactory, you get paid X dollars, if you do very good by your own measurement, if there are any, you get the same salary, and if you've busted your whatever, you will get the same salary. In my approach, and it's in the book, I don't can't go into it, you align the different standards of performance and results with a range of reward systems. Specifically money, but it could be added vacation or parking space of the month or, you know, if you have a cafeteria reward system, as some companies do, then you pick your own reward per range of performance. This is the PEMBOX slide, it's chapter 14 in the book, and it's an Excel spreadsheet, and you go to the publisher's website and you can put in your own metrics. There's about 200 metrics in the book. But I want to show you, because I've got time, to show how I inductively uh, get metrics from you that you know, but you don't know you know. And that's the fun part of this for me is, to let people know what they don't think they know, but do. And here you see uh, the graphic of the pie showing the weightings. And 
forgot which. Yeah, Microsoft Excel. Key value areas and the weightings are business management, marketing management, physical security, biometrics, and sales. And then there's a lot more to it going up and down. And that could be for a whole project or it could be for an individual. And then you would go up and down in the Excel hierarchy. Now, in terms of magnify, that has to do with performance expectations. Don't lower your expectations to meet your performance. Raise your level of performance to meet your expectation. You might use that for all of life, but I'm not here for your entire life. Okay. Case study. So let's assume you're a project manager at Horizon Company. I hope there isn't an Horizon Company. <laughs> and there might be. I've had, when I started using 3Ms maybe uh, 15 years ago, people said the 3Ms company might come after you. Well, they haven't, not yet. Okay. The VP of the PMO, that's the program management office, is asking you to plan a customer service training program. Customer complaint numbers are climbing due to late resolution. By resolution, I mean customer is satisfied. There's no, as opposed to customer contact or customer inquiry. So I use the term re resolution, there's no more customer issue. And it's been climbing from five a month to 10 a month, and it needs to be at, at or below five a month. I use that parity to mean equal to or less than. Ma'am? So you start with a metric that said that the customer complaints are climbing. Why do you need to be good at training as a solution, or is this just an example? Excellent. Yeah, training is often seen as the solution and often as part of it. You know, it might be an OD thing. It might be lack of clarity regarding what customer relationship managers are supposed to deliver. But I just use something okay. simple for the this rather superficial introduction to what's a very profound approach. <laughs> okay. Customer service. Anticipated results of customer service training. And again, that's really great that you raised that. This is just one slice of a multiple number of solutions of a specific increase of customer complaints or a decrease of customer inquiries reaching the resolution state. The satisfactory would be customer complaints will be addressed within 48 hours. And I'm using quantitative metrics because those are the ones you're most familiar with. And qualitative metrics takes sometimes brain surgery uh, for some people to get away from the quantitative orientation of most of you here making an assumption. Okay. And very good would be addressed within 24 hours. And this is not necessarily better, but faster. And very good is typically better, faster, cheaper than satisfactory. And excellent would be resolve the customer satisfaction at the phone call or the email. There's no further, it doesn't go beyond that, which requires a very high level of responsiveness on the part of whoever answered the phone or first saw that email. So Exxon is exceptionally of a higher quality and maybe higher quantity of service delivery. And address means registered for resolution like a ticket number, <coughs> as I'm sure many of you have dealt with. And resolve means no longer a customer issue. And here's the trainers. And it's not just the trainer, it's the training KVA of the individual. How many of you have a trainer role within your project management role? You know, you're probably training new people or old people in a new methodology. <laughs> Maybe the one that John introduced. So I think people at a certain level of management all are training someone. And some of you may be training your boss who doesn't exactly know enough about what you do. So we're dealing with the performance objective of customer service. We're not talking about the others. We're not talking about the administrative or the coaching element of that trainer role. Managed. 
to manage and improve the verified baseline of customer complaints being addressed within the last, it could be the last two years or the last year, but you don't just pick a number out of the sky. Although for some environments that I work in, there's been no baseline. No one's tracking anything. So I just have to hypothesize what it might have been or what it ought to be given my very quick assessment of the organizational capacity. And you verify the baseline of complaints resolution within the last two years, determine what skills, reward systems, and again, to address your question about why training, I'm addressing other solutions that are part of why customer complaints have been rising or they're not being resolved as quickly as has been promised, and conduct the training, etc. So that's the managed part. And magnify, after a year or two, change the performance standards so that satisfactory customer complaints will be addressed within 24 hours. And what were they at first? 48. 48. Mm -hmm. So we're raising the bar. That's the magnify. And very good. And here's a picture of a performance scorecard. Again, there's more of them in the book. The KVA, that's the value area the weightings of the specific performance objective. Peer training has several performance objectives. Some of them just have one. The performance standard, and three is very good, two is satisfactory, and one is unsatisfactory. And I never really define one except it's something lacking of satisfactory. So there's really no need to put any effort into that. So the weighting times the performance standard is the value and here the value is 2.8, which is close to very good. And then in the book you'll see performance standard ranges align with reward ranges. And here's just another. There are many formats. And when I've had long-term clients, I've told them what I'm introducing is a straitjacket. Adopt. If I come back later or keep working with you and you're not adapting, it's not taking, it's not um, sticking. Because there's nothing anyone can, can introduce initially, have it be used by a client and stay the way it was introduced. And that's why, as you know, people in the software business, you know, the money is not the software. The money is in the follow-up and support and modification of whatever you thought was so wonderful initially. And I've got a whole bunch of additional concepts, and you'll get that by email, but we're not going to go into that now. Here's something that I got from a book called Reinventing Government, and it really is about the dynamic of this whole process, generally. And the rest of you can observe, and be boy yours, and be thankful that you did Well, you point to me, because <laughs> yeah. This is only my second time here, and I thought you wanted me to come back. He, he's raising his hand. I said I, I'm, I'm okay. I'll ask for volunteer now. Wait, okay. just read this, okay. and what you're going to see, even before your eyes, lo and behold, you'll see these dynamics taking place, even in this room, with one person, and you just have to imagine it taking place in a larger macro environment by a team. How many of you in this room work with someone else in the room? None of you? Because when that happens, I can show for the two of you who aren't here that when you get agreement, you will reach understandings you didn't have before, even if it's a good relationship. When I was in Chicago, I worked with AT&T. I worked with the engineers that created 911. You've all heard of 911? Yes. Oh, good. Anyway, <laughs> so these guys were very you know, brilliant, and they knew about their nanoseconds of 911. But when it came to a managerial level of the key value areas that they were contributing to AT&T and to each other, you'd think they hadn't even seen each other before. And these were people who had worked together for 10 to 15 years. So it's really remarkable still to me how this exercise gets people into a deeper or higher or broader level of understanding of their obligation to other or their expectations of other. And this is defined very precisely. One thing I'll email you is, I've done this presentation with some frequency 
And over the years, people have said, I wish I knew about this for my marriage, <laughs> to get precise metrics of mutual expectations. So I'm going to send you the outline of my next book called The Metrics of Relationships. That's for another uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Too <laughs> No, actually, uh, just to share something personally, this is Phyllis, and she and I dated 20 years ago. And after her second divorce, and by my too many girlfriends, we've reconnected. So it's, it's still kind of amazing to us. <laughs> amazing being a very precise metric. <laughs> now, that'll probably be in the book, too. But anonymously. So I'll send you the book on the metrics of relationships. And I've conducted that workshop on relationships which has a very different flavor of uh, the dynamics. OK, end of the formal presentation. Now, I'd like someone to volunteer. Now, whoever volunteers for to be more public about their KVA, I'd like all of the rest of you to follow along with it. And I've got another 25 minutes, right? Till 9? OK, I want to be precise. Oh, the gentleman in the back is uh, a videographer because I've never had this presentation uh, taped, and maybe it's something that PMI SFC might consider for future programming. OK, I'd like to get to Word on this, so I can project the answers on the screen. Yeah. Years ago, I'd be on a flip chart, but... <laughs> Dragged into the world of. <laughs> no, I've worked in 26 countries. Now, what I'm going to ask you, and basically the methodology is I have the questions and you have the answers. But without my questions, you can't access your answers until you internalize my repertoire of questions. But the essential question is this, and I ask it in many different ways. Tell, can you tell yourself in precise, qualitative, and quantitative terms or metrics why you get paid the money you make? Because when you deliver what you're supposed to deliver for the money you make, that's called value. That's why my whole approach is called value-based metrics for improving results. Okay, that's the essence of the whole thing. Okay, Vivek, have a seat. I don't remember having an appointment with you. But. <laughs> All right, Vic, think of your project manager role. Tell me the value you contribute to that role in one or two words. Um, effectiveness. Is that it? That, and that accuracy and effectiveness summed up, sums up to 100% of the value you create or deliver? No. Um, I guess completeness. Oh, just in terms of the audience participation. Have we ever met before? <laughs> <laughs> but I might have dated one of your exes. <laughs> Accuracy, effectiveness, and completeness sum up to 100% of your deliverables for your paycheck. No. Um, probably. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how to put it in words. Um, people I work with, people that are responsible for dealing with a customer. It's, it's a shame, but they don't have a command of the language. So 
I don't know how you put that down, language. Or linguistics or language. Linguistics or, you know, the English, the English language. Yeah. People, people can't write. Okay. I can't spell the English. The rest of you should be writing, answering my question <laughs> for your project management role. All right. If you don't do it, you won't get hooked. It won't engage you emotionally to think about the metrics of your role. I mean, I can't force you to do it, but you better. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to continue with Vic and hope and pray that the rest of you are doing this for yourself. Because some of you may raise questions about your particular value that Vic won't raise. So, all right. Now, we have four areas of value, and they sum up to 100%. Right. I would like you to give a weighting to each one. In, in my mind or my... Your own. We start with you, okay. and here's the next step. You go to your boss or to okay. your client, you go to your subordinates, and you present to them, this is how I define my project management role and the value I contribute because hierarchically they their output is your input. Okay. So it's alignment, up and down. In, in my mind, as sad as it is, linguistics has to be forty percent. That's that's a sad indictment, but it's true. All right, we've got sixty percent left. Okay. Now I'm gonna make this easy for you because yeah. one of my rules and it's in the book a key value area, and I define the word key as having a weighting of no less than 20%. In other words, it's not key or significant. That's what, one thing you see in my methodology, which you can't get into, at some point you're not allowed to use adjectives or adverbs because those are all judgmental and interpretive. <laughs> you know, someone says, do it quick, next minute, next day, next week. And you've all had misunderstandings when someone said to you, do it right away. Because what's the context of right away? Okay? Or I want you to be accurate. Was accurate to the hour, the day, the week, the nanosecond. So our normal social and often too often work conversation is full of ambiguity. Now, I'm, I have a multiple personality, if you haven't figured that out already. But if I'm at a party and someone says, nice weather we're having, I don't say, as defined by what barometric pressure <laughs> and what cloud density and what percent possibility of rain or a blizzard. So I can No wonder you were so attractive. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. Okay, so I'm going to give you that the rest of 20. This is good. Okay. 20% waiting. Okay, that's the easy part. We've defined per dollar of his fee or salary, whatever your status is, that 20 cent deliverable has been accurate at a standard called satisfactory, where you're happy with it, your boss is happy with it, your clients, your subordinate, how will I know it? What degree of accuracy are we talking about at satisfactory? Uh, satisfactory is, is actually pretty high. A zero uh, customer <coughs> return, customer rejections. It's, it's documents. It's, that that means that, that that's the satisfactory expectation that... Uh, Okay, now at very good, which is a standard of performance better than that, what's your accuracy definition? Wow. It can't be better than right, zero. Right. So zero is probably not just satisfactory. Zero is perfection, correct? Yeah, you're right. I. It's not, because of the other metrics, it's not, it's not expected that something will be returned, so that's, that's a hard one. So make it, make it zero for three and then one for two. Okay, so zero is three. Yeah. Now, at excellent, 
See where we're going with this? <laughs> By the way, this is a very typical dynamic. And if you look at the last two slides that you, that you have on your paper, going through this process poses new questions, questions you never asked before. And that's what makes it interesting and exciting to me, because you could have worked in your field for 100 years, and you probably have not gone through this okay. kind of exercise. Or if you have, it's still been fraught. Oh, I love that word. It's been fraught with ambiguity. All right. Okay. Can I change the metric? Yes. Okay. So four, four would be zero customer returns. Now, I said earlier, excellent has to be achievable. Right. Is that achievable? Yes. It is. Yes. Okay. What I encourage people is not to go for perfect, but it might be 0.001. All right. Well, Even at excellent, it should be some kind of wiggle room. All right. If you want, if you prefer that, then it would be 98% uh, uh, yeah. customer acceptance. Oops. Okay. And what about very good? Very good would be um, um, uh, 97, no, 96. No, no, no. Okay. Go on. <laughs> this is tricky. Could it be uh, the metric change, or does it have to stay the same metric? That's the reason I'm asking is very good would be um, uh, Less than 10% uh, reworked, you know, redone. Okay, equal to or less than 10. So, so maybe make it 90% first pass yield or something like that? Would that would well, give that me your language again, the words? Not less than 10%. Less than uh, re reworked. Or redone. Reworked, redone. By the way, it's not, what's not, what's, an initiating dialogue is that you and I agree. What's more important is tomorrow, when you get together with your work team, mm -hmm. that you reach agreement regarding some of these words might lead to lengthy discussion. But however lengthy it is, you ought to have it and conclude it so over the year you're not arguing about whether the work was good <coughs> or very good or excellent. That's why I always, in so many performance evaluation processes are binary, you know, pass-fail, meets expectations, doesn't. And the reason I like to do satisfactory, very good and excellent, it forces people to think in more precise metric terms. Okay, I'm going to stop you now. All right. Um, and we have to change two. Okay, what about two? Let's do that. Let's make it uh, less than 20 percent. Okay, that's, that's the essence of the whole procedure. And then we would go through this with effectiveness and completeness. And the whole exercise is, again, my question or the initial question is, if by year end you've created the value that you're paid to produce at a standard of at least satisfactory, how will you know it? And better than just, let's say, me and you, it's you and me. Because as you'll see in the intro to the book, my approach is not that of an accountant or an engineer or a physicist. It's as a linguist. This is primarily a linguistics of reaching mutual understanding about something that has to get done by a number of people who are interdependent and dependent on, probably dependent on a common reward system. So that's the, the motivational element of doing any of this or it's customer satisfaction, or something of that sort. Well, you know, one of the metrics that we use at work a lot is, was the, bud was the project completed on time or within budget? And the problem with that, at least in my environment, is that we just re-baseline every time there's something new, mm -hmm. because we get new information or whatever, and that's always proven to not be a good metric even though that's the metric that they say we have to measure. Excellent. Okay. One thing in a lengthier introduction is all of this for Vic is a fantasy. You've not gone through these procedures 
with these metrics in mind before. And what will happen inevitably is, as the bumper sticker says, stuff happens, <laughs> okay? And more important than whatever metric you agree to now is you have this linguistic dialogue methodology to discuss that the standards are higher or lower or it was the wrong metric or the weighting is not nearly as much as we thought it would be and then you just keep talking to each other. So really the three M's of the metrics of project management ought to become the metrics of conversation. You know, people actually talking to each other. And it's amazing to me, while it was at Oracle and other companies I've worked at, is how siloed organizations become. And you know that term, I'm sure you've heard it often. So, smell. Yes. Our president, Quayma. <laughs> Quayma. In that situation, on time and within budget, because that's the minimum I'm supposed to do, whatever, wouldn't it be X percentage? Are you talking about per project or more projects? Wouldn't it be X percentage of projects on time? Or um, she was just, just defined what well, that's time the, That's the universal that a successful project meets all the specs on time and within budget. Right. And that's the generic metrics of all projects. But shouldn't we then get beyond the generic and Good. more specific? I mean, we were just saying we're very specific and then definition as well. Right. Because we can't, especially in some environments, control this stuff happens. Right. Yeah. And what happens if you use this methodology and this framework, at some point, the powers on high will say, we don't care what it's going to cost, you cannot negotiate timeliness. And that means the weightedness has changed. But with this weightedness, you'll be able to discuss, you know, that weightedness of within budget, that was 40% important, it's now 60%. And you can be very precise in your conversation. How many of you have ever been given a task of someone said to you, I don't care how long it takes, I want it to be near perfect? In that person's mind, the weightedness of, of quality was 90% and cost and timeliness was 10%. And you've been given a task of, I don't care what it looks like, I want it tomorrow. Yes. That's where the, weight, that's where the, weight, the weightedness was 90% and the quality was 10%. We're all, we all think this way anyway, but we don't think so precisely and so technically about how we run each day. You know, even for me, and I'm very precise about finishing by 9 o'clock, is because I'm thinking, I think my quality has been at least satisfactory, and I'm here to fulfill an obligation of finishing by 9, because you all have, you know, wild parties to go to tonight. So I want to be out of here. I have one quick question. So if the areas yeah. you're, you're measuring here, your key values areas, there's something to qualify as a key value area, has to be about 20%. That's so, my definition of the word key. You can say significant, important, but the weightedness is at least 20%. So it's, uh, let's see, Vic, Vic had four. Right. So if it's 20, suppose he really felt that he had six things that qualify, that something isn't going to be 20. Exactly, no. My, my initial straitjacket approach because it's adopt is will force the weightedness so it fits into my template and then at some point you'll argue that a key value area in our environment has to be less than 20% and I'll say fine. But you'll, you'll do it knowing what my methodology is. Or you'll, you will not violate the integrity of the dialogue, of the linguistics. Because yeah. the numbers get too small. Exactly, and the, but the danger of making a KVA less than 20%, the other rule is a performance objective cannot be less than 10, 10%. So you can have five KVAs at 20%, and each KVA can have two performance objectives. So you can get down to 10 performance objectives that are weighted with metrics, 
according to this methodology. Now, I had one client, he liked the process, but he would take like accuracy and he'd raise it to 100% of all value and then break that down into five and six different. So it's very flexible without violating the integrity of the linguistic preciseness of the whole approach. Now that's what's, this really, it's not an accounting exercise, it's not engineering, which is maybe the backgrounds of a lot of you, it's linguistics, interdependent tasks that have to be done, meeting certain specs within budget, within time, etc., and with quality uh, variables. Okay, I thank you, and I guess, do you raffle the book, or what's your? We have a raffle. Yeah, we have some things we got to raffle. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.